Okay, we're a little after the hour and it looks like um, most folks that are planning to come have joined. So first, I just want to say welcome to this OSF Collections webinar. I'll introduce myself. I'm Nikki Pfeiffer, Director of Product at COS, and my colleague, David Meller, has also joined in this discussion. He waved. I don't know if he wants Hi, to introduce himself. <laughs> Thanks. I'm David Meller, from the, obviously here from the Center for Open Science as well. I work on our uh, policy initiatives with funders, journals, and societies on obviously promoting open science practices and policies. Thanks, David. Thanks for joining us today. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the webinar on OSF Collections. We're going to talk about um, recent infrastructure that COS has developed and launched um, that is intended to support research discovery, collaboration, and re reuse, which is the OSF Collections infrastructure. So um, you've all joined us today because you care just like we do about research integrity. In fact, um, I think just like us, you have a commitment to a framework for research which fosters the principles of research integrity, making things ethical, responsible, transparent, and, and rigorous as the top priority. This framework that we're talking about is all designed to help support um, a change in research culture. Um, we need a framework that will foster communities to, and be empowered uh, to demonstrate these new norms. Um, so this pyramid sort of represents what is um, the, the peers, the, the different tiers that are needed to really support a research uh, culture change. Um, the first being infrastructure that makes it possible. Um, a user interface and experience that makes it easy for them to come in and, and do their work. Um, communities that uh, foster these, uh, these beliefs and these practices and make it more normative. Incentives uh, that make it rewarding and policies that make it required. Um, in order to foster these new norms and communities, we need this infrastructure to facilitate open sharing, collaboration, improved rigor of research, and to ensure that research findings are discoverable, reproducible, and reusable. So OSF Collections um, is, a, is a solution to facilitate that for funders, societies, journals, communities, just general organizations with this this uh, in initiative and, and important factor, um, lab groups and consortia projects. This uh, OSF collections enables them to advance their open policies and incentives to demonstrate their transparency and rigor of research outputs through their sharing and collaboration and to ensure access and reuse through discovery. Um, a quick overview of OSF collections. Um, OSF collections collects and aggregates OSF projects. It displays them on a branded discovery interface and it leverages the OSF project structure and flexibility to enable collaboration and rigor in research workflows, making the research process open, transparent, and accessible. So we'll do a quick um, focus in on, on different um, areas where uh, a collection can support a specific audience need or stakeholder need. Um, so OSF collections supports needs for funders where they can implement their open policies, they can track their compliance of those policies among their research community, they can incentivize more transparent methods in research, they can make all the outputs discoverable, they can enable and enable re reuse of those outputs um, from their research dollars, and they can cultivate more knowledge exchange between the researchers they fund and, and beyond. Looking um, at the same for a collection use case for a journal, um, it helps a journal organize the supplemental materials that underlie um, the research articles. It aggregates that underlying data. It demonstrates the transparency and rigor of those findings that are being published. It also allows you to connect more with the community as they're doing their ongoing research efforts, not just at the end. Um, and it supports uh, the ability to be top compliant. And just looking at collections for communities of practice, um, which has a broad sort of uh, 
span of, of opportunities, it can help aggregate just the open outputs, the data from a large study um, or other methods and methodologies that you wish to share across your community. It can help demonstrate what best practice looks like and it can connect with the community um, in ways where they can share and collaborate and foster those new normative behaviors. And it really facilitates um, sort of that open sharing and ability to see what's um, see what different projects are doing and, and be able to engage in collaboration with them. Um, so at the core of any collection is the OSF project. Again, that's what is being aggregated in the collection um, are OSF projects. And let's do a quick refresh on the, re the robust functionality built into the OSF that supports open, transparent, and rigor in the research workflow. So at the core of OSF, we have open source developed software. We have a public open API. OSF projects have a very flexible structure where you can have um, granular permissions and access controls with the ability to add components um, and folders within that structure. You can register DOIs for, um, for projects and, and components. You can affiliate your institution. Um, it also, the OSF supports 11 different file storage integrations, allowing you to not move files back and forth, but actually be able to just connect with where you currently are working. The OSF also supports um, over 500 different file types, meaning um, some of those special files could, could be easily rendered and viewed in the browser. And also uh, the OSF um, offers file metadata um, actually to be coming very soon, but something we've been working on and we're excited to offer that um, later this year. So now I want to demonstrate collections to you. Um, we will sort of start by looking at a population, populated collection that exists already um, at their branded discovery page. We'll navigate and look at submission using the submission, simple submission workflow. We'll look at how a custom metadata for a collection submissions enables, you know, better discovery and organization of the content. And finally, we'll look at how the OSF project that is part of a collection, how it affiliates back to that collection. Let's see, one second while I transition. Okay. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. So here we have a collection on coronavirus outbreak research. On this um, landing page, you can see the branding um, colors and a logo for this, this collection. This is all something that can be provided by the admin of the collection that's customizable. Also notice that the name and the URL is something that you can brand as well. Um, so coronavirus would be where you could swap your organization's name if you wanted to. Um, so if we start to look at the, the functionality on this discover page, you can see that you can um, facet your results. So currently it shows all results, but you can facet to look for things like all active COVID-19 research and it will populate only those, uh, those projects that fit that criteria. You can also further um, refine your search by putting in things like tags that will then facet the um, results even more to find only COVID-19 active projects that have, uh, have been tagged with stress, so stress-related um, research, if that was something I was interested in looking up. You can also do the same like I've done with tags for contributors, if there's a specific contributor that you know published research in this collection and you're very interested in finding that and potentially you know, reusing data or collaborating with them. Um, you can also, uh, sort the results by relevance, the modified date, oldest to newest or new to, newest to oldest. So I have it ordered so that I can see the most recently modified studies mean they've had the most recent activity. Um, now let's look at how submissions to this collection um, happen and what the process, what the simple submission um, workflow looks like. So when you go in um, to add, a, add to collection, you're, you're taken to a page where you would select um, an existing uh, project in your OSF profile. You'll be 
able to populate. Um, it brings over the metadata that your project already has, but you can um, certainly update um, that existing metadata that might make it more relevant in discovery for you in the collection. Um, you can see the list of contributors already on the project. If there are none, you can certainly add others um, and do uh, granular permissions for each of them. And you can invite um, users that are not on the OSF uh, very simply with uh, their name and email. And this last part is the custom metadata that each collection uh, gets to put together when it gets set up. So here we have um, being able to submit your coronavirus research um, and, and, and tag it whether it's um, MERS, SARS, or COVID-19 related. So I will pick one of these and also to provide the status, active archive completed or proposed. Again, these are customizable. So a collection could have a, a journal um, issue and volume, uh, for example, or a funder might want to put their specific program areas um, and the status of the work to be able to um, ensure that you can keep track of, of those projects as they come in. As every project gets submitted to the collection, um, it is going to be made public so that it's discoverable if it's not already. So let's look at the um, one of the projects that was in that first collection that we were we were sorting through the results. So one of the things that um, on these on these projects, it will indicate that it is part of this collection as well as the metadata that was associated. So the type and status are here. What's interesting is that this this project is also um, containing supplemental materials for a preprint that's on site archive. So you can see both of those aspects of where this um, research is being indexed and discoverable. Okay, I'm going to switch back over to the slides and David's going to talk a little bit about the different partners use cases and examples that um, that he's been working through with several folks. Thanks, Nikki. Um, yeah, and just to address one, one question from Adrian that came in, um, this is really what I'm gonna focus on right now. Can you say more about top compliance? Um, and before I say that, <clears throat> I really wanna emphasize that the, here we go, the top guidelines. The, the reason we exist as an organization is as a culture change organization who, um, advocates for better practices and policies around open, transparent, and reproducible research. And um, these OSF collections are really designed for institutions to support the implementation of these types of practices. So I'm gonna, uh, before I give a couple of examples of what um, a funder and what a journal is doing to complement their policies, I'm gonna step back a little bit and describe the top guidelines precisely what they are and um, give some examples of, of what we're doing to um, support implementation of policies and practices that lead to more open research that's more verifiable and, and more easily um, reproducible. So the, the top guidelines, the transparency and openness promotion guidelines are a set of eight standards for journals or funders to implement uh, that describe how grantees or how authors should uh, instruct this audience on how they should apply these practices to the work that's getting funded or published. So an example of that would be the, the data transparency standard. Um, each of the different standards are, can be applied in one of three levels of increasing rigor. Uh, the basic uh, beginning of the top guidelines is a requirement for disclosure. Simply state whether or not the, the data are available or for take an example from the, some of the other standards, whether or not the, the materials or the code are available, whether or not reporting guidelines have been used, or other steps such as whether or not the work was pre-registered. It goes up from there requiring such actions or requiring that um, a third party verify that these actions have been um, done to a sufficiently detailed degree. Um, but most of our work is really focused around uh, really raising the bar a little bit just to make sure that it's simply clear and easy to understand whether or not the funded work or the published work 
um, has underlying data, materials, code, or, or registrations available with it. I'm going to actually um, take over the screen share. So, uh, uh, Nikki, if you would be so kind as to stop sharing your screen, I'm going to point to, and I'm going a little bit off the cuff here. I'm just going to go to desktop. Sorry about that. Share, okay. And the top guidelines, as I said, are for, um, pr provide specific recommendations for funders and publishers um, to give instructions to their funded work or to their um, published work, the authors of that to describe steps that should be taken to share data, to pre-register the work, or give recommendations to those entities for how work should be replicated. Uh, these were, again, published in, in 2015, and for the past several years, we've been supporting institutions um, and, and funders and publishers with um, implementation of these practices. They're widely endorsed in the publishing and, and funding community, um, and a lot of our recent work has been around um, you know, evaluating the degree to which various entities are um, adopting these policies and supporting adoption of these with um, individual stakeholders. But more of what we want to be doing um, over the next several years is um, providing specific tools for entities to, uh, uh, to, to complement their efforts. And so here's an example from the International Life Science Institute of North America. It's a funding organization um, supported by industry in order to uh, um, support research in, in life and environmental and health sciences. Um, and so here's a collection that they have um, up on the OSF. And this is as part of their effort to um, implement the top guidelines. So they require disclosure um, amongst the recently funded work um, of whether or not the work was pre-registered. If the work was pre-registered, they um, require verification that the um, results are being reported as specified ahead of time and require material sharing. So amongst the work that's recently been funded, I believe they've been doing this for about six months now, uh, roughly. Um, here is a sort of a list of ongoing projects that uh, are under those mandates that are being um, covered by the top guidelines by ILSI North America. Here is uh, one of the projects that has recently been uh, uh, you know, uploaded and who's, who's um, I, I believe that the study is not yet completed and so their data aren't yet available but there is a registration of this uh, study up and available for uh, for readers to evaluate and this is the um, again the pre-registration that covers the pre-specified uh, hypotheses data and data collection plan and data analysis plan once results are ready for that. So this was just um, obviously registered uh, about a week ago. Uh, there will be a f uh, the ability for researchers to, to post whether or not the, the results are being reported. And of course, it's not available here yet um, because it was just implemented within the past week. Um, but here is an example of a uh, pre-registration. This is a, the example of registration. If you go to our main registries page and look for an example, this is the first one that pops up. And this is a, a study that we were conducting with a couple of colleagues on evaluating how folks pre-register. And um, the work for that um, has been reported as a preprint. And so that's available for, um, for review at this time. And we're, uh, you know, it's currently in review for publication at a journal. But as of right now, um, the results are reported right there. The Journal of Business and Psychology also strongly encourages data sharing and, and acts such as pre-registration, but they're not, they're not at the level two that I described with the um, International Life Science Institute. Um, they, they're strongly encouraging data sharing and instructions to authors indicate um, that, that there's an expectation that data be shared. And during the uh, review and acceptance of articles, editors reach out to the authors 
um, and instruct them to share any materials that are shareable, post any data that can be shared or posted, post the analytical code if it's available to be posted. And this is something that's been, um, that the editors there have been doing for the past, again, roughly six months. And here are the um, articles and data that are, uh, th that are, um, that are available from the the most recent uh, <laughs> the most recent issues in the journal. And so, if you go to any of the OSF projects that are associated with them, you can see which materials the authors have determined are are shareable and they would like to make available. Um, so, this is the online syntax that is available from this particular author. Um, and there's sort of a uh, variety of different instruments and materials available for this project. Um, again, associated with a particular study that's been published within the Journal of Business and Psychology. So what I'm gonna do right now is stop sharing this. And pass it back to Nikki. Uh, for a little bit more description about what we're doing to roll out the uh, roll out the offers for this. Okay, are you seeing my screen? I see your screen. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, that was a, a great overview from David and, and hopefully uh, gave you some really good uh, real life examples of how a collection could fit into um, your specific needs and, and, and workflow. Um, Nikki, sorry to butt in. Um, I see the presenter view is being shared. I'm oh. not sure if that's the one you wanted to share. No, it's not. Sorry. Maybe swap displays. That might be the, I'm not sure. There it goes. Yep, that's right. Okay, perfect. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, so OSF Collections is um, is an, an interface that we're offering. It's it's branding and aggregation on top of what researchers can get just by using the OSF. It provides a different view into um, that subset of projects. And um, we're offering that at an annual fee of $5,000, but we are discounting that currently um, to $3,500 annually because we are still working on it. We currently are um, offering the branded discovery page, submission, and custom metadata, but we are planning to add on to that a moderation layer. So there would be the uh, possibility in the future that as these submissions, these projects get submitted into your collection, you can accept or reject them um, before they're made public on the, on the discovery page. And even in that workflow, there's a little bit of opportunity to give feedback to the submitting authors on um, any aspects of the metadata or materials that you would like included perhaps that aren't there or any, any sort of feedback um, on those collections, on those projects for the collection. So that essentially wraps up our portion of an overview and walkthrough of, of OSF collections, but we certainly want to open up for any questions that you might have. We'll, we'll look at the Q&A and answer any of those that we haven't gotten to. So if you have any of those, now's a good time to go ahead and write them in and we'll, we'll work through them. And also just to thank you for your time listening and, and learning more about how OSF collections could support your needs. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to either David or I, our email addresses are on the screen. And we look forward to hearing from you. So let's see if there's any, anything in the Q&A. Looks like just more about the top, um, top compliance, which I think David has covered. I don't know if there's anything further you wanna to add to that, David, um, or if anyone has anything else to ask about those. Yeah, uh, um, really it's, it can complement any of the different ways to uh, implement the top guidelines. Um, frankly, one of the ways that we often see in um, 
funder language or in, in journal author guidelines. Um, we, we see things that we describe as not being compliant with the top guidelines. We call those level zeros, encouragements. Um, and one of the things we want to uh, raise the bar with is to get beyond that and sort of require disclosure, require transparency when it's ethically and legally available, and um, enable what we call computational verification uh, or computational reproducibility to check whether or not the work can be done. Um, and frankly, the, the OSF collections can support any of that range of implementations. Um, though we don't like those not too effective encouragement level zero type things, OSF collections does support that if you encourage um, activities such as data sharing and point to an OSF collection, that can be a way to um, you know, support uh, the, the types of policies you see all the time. If you want to raise the bar, and I'd be happy to um, help you work through that to um, standardize disclosure requirements, level one, a mandate for, for data sharing, level two, or even computational reproducibility, level three. Um, OSF projects in general, and these OSF collections in, in particular, um, support any of those types of implementations of, of new policies. Um, so, uh, so I wouldn't say that any of these are, um, force you into, for example, an open data policy or an open data mandate that you might be hesitant to implement. There, there's often lots of discussion about the best way or the appropriateness of, of going to those higher level um, open data requirements. Um, if, if you are interested in OSF collections, it, it doesn't push you into that. It really supports encouragement or disclosures and gives you a place to, to point authors to so that they know where um, data sharing can happen if they wanted to. But if you're in the camp um, and, and you're um, ready and able to push the button on a sort of a stronger open data mandate, OSF collections is still sort of appropriate. That can be the place where that happens. Um, if there isn't already an existing repository appropriate, or um, if you want to make sure that the work is registered prior to conducting the study. Uh, those, as I showed earlier, um, each of these projects supports all the different open science practices that we advocate for, data sharing, materials and code sharing, um, and other activities, especially things like registration, which is commonplace in some communities, is brand new to many other communities, and we're working to make that as easy as possible for any researcher that's kind of wanting to dip their toe into that for the first time. Thanks, David, for, for more detail on the top compliance and how it fits well with uh, OSF collection. Um, well, we have no other questions that are open. So um, if you think of those, please, again, feel free to reach out to David or I. Um, our email addresses were on the slides and um, we'll be sending the video and slides out to you, for those that are on the webinar now registered. So you can certainly follow up with us that way too. Um, so I think that's it. Thank you all for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>